Hello. Hello and welcome everyone to SDVOE Live. I'm your host, Justin Kennington, and this is TV for Pro AV. We're going to talk a little something a little bit different this week. We're going to talk about USB. Uh, right, what started out now 25 years ago, if you can believe it, uh, as a simplified way to hook up your, your mouse and keyboard and maybe your printer, uh, has really turned into something very different uh, that now affects Pro-AV in a big way. Uh, so today we're going to try and dissect things a little bit. We're going to talk about USB 2, USB 3, USB 4, uh, and, and how does USB-C fit into all of that? Uh, our guest is Tavis Sparrow. He's a technical business manager with Icron. Uh, I hope many of you know Icron already. They're a member of the SDVOE Alliance, uh, but they're also some leading experts in the field of, of USB extension and switching. Uh, and we're also going to dive into why is that a challenging field uh, that deserves to even have a leader, right? Just use a longer cable, can't you? Uh, it's not that simple. Tavis will explain a little bit about why. Um, before we jump into the rest of the show, a couple of agenda items to cover. I want all of you to join us for our after show. Uh, that's exclusive content available for anyone watching live uh, or anyone watching inside the SDVOE Academy. Uh, so those of you watching live inside the Academy, it's very simple to watch the after show. All you have to do is sit right there and don't move. Uh, but those of you watching this on demand, I want to look in the episode description uh, below, uh, find a link that's going to take you over to the Academy page where you can log in for free and check out that after show. Uh, don't miss it. That's when we're going to take your questions uh, in, in a live and interactive way. Very exciting. Um, so without much further ado, uh, we're going to go to a quick quiz question to check your knowledge and see, see how much you're up on USB already. Uh, and then after that, you will see my co-host Matt Dodd over in our classroom to talk you through uh, our next segment. Hello everybody, hope you're well. Thanks for joining us once again here in SDVOE House. Um, USB, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big topic and it's a growing topic as you'll see as we discuss and, and dive into this a little bit more detail. Uh, Tavis really is um, a bottomless pit of information when it comes to, uh, comes to any, everything USB. Uh, and since we've been putting this together, uh, this courseware together, uh, it's incredible just how much the, you, know, you really do need to think about it. That's why we've called this course, So You Think You Know USB. Uh, we're not trying to be uh, patronizing in any way, shape or form, but there really is quite a lot to think about. Uh, and I think there's, uh, there's quite a lot of misconceptions that we're going to hopefully clear up for you today. So without further ado, here's a snippet from the latest course on Academy. You'll find it in System Design. We'll be back with you shortly. So. We've all seen USB ports on equipment, and we're all pretty familiar with them, but how much do you know about how USB works? Are you able to explain to a customer the relationship between USB types, payload, and data throughput to allow them to make an informed decision about which USB type to choose? This short course will lay out the building blocks to give you more confidence in making sure your customers are furnished with the facts they need to know. The Universal Serial Bus has been a familiar friend since 1996 offering a much simpler way to connect with devices such as keyboards, mice, and printers. In those early years, USB 1.1 gave us up to 12 megabits per second of bandwidth to work with, also known as full speed. Plenty for those tabletop human interface devices commonly referred to as HID devices. By 2001, USB 2.0 came on the scene with 480 megabits of bandwidth, also known as high speed, and ushered in a new era of convenient to connect, sophisticated products such as mass storage devices, thumb drives, high-speed network adapters, external displays, and of course, streaming cameras. Starting back in 2011, USB 3 has been adopted by the vast majority of contemporary host devices, including PCs, laptops, tablets, smartphones, and gaming consoles, to name a few. Within the USB 3 standard, we've arrived at version 3.2 and break down bandwidth into Gen 1, which is five gigabits per second, also known as super speed, Gen 2, which is 10 gigabits per second, also known as super speed plus and Gen 2x2, two two, which is 20 gigabits per second, also known as SuperSpeed++. Put simply, we now benefit from much richer experiences beyond what USB 2 bandwidth can provide. Is USB 3 just a faster flavor of USB 2? 
how host hubs and devices communicate with one another has also evolved. Prior to USB 3, USB 2.0 and 1.1 were half duplex systems, meaning data could only be transmitted in one direction at a time, just like speaking on a walkie talkie. You only need one pair of wires for the job, which is why those familiar Type A connectors have four pins on them two for communication and two for power and ground. USB 3 introduces full duplex communication, whereby both sides of the USB network can transmit to each other at the same time. We go from the walkie talkie experience to a phone call. For this full duplex mode of communication, we need more wires to work with. So the next time you look at those blue colored type A connectors, you may notice the second row of five pins buried in the connector. Two pins for transmit, two pins for receive, and another pin, ground pin that's tied to the shield of the cable. The takeaway, the USB 3 traffic runs across a different communication path than USB 2.0 and 1.1. Hello, sir. Cool. Hi. How are you? I couldn't. I couldn't. I'm good, thank you. I couldn't help but thinking of, of our conversations here uh, as Tavis was laying out the difference between walkie-talkies and, and telephones and, mm -hmm. and, and this wonderful ability that we have to speak at the same time through this medium. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Um, and in fact, that course is, uh, it, we, we just published it on Academy uh, and it is pretty fantastic because after that section, uh, it goes into the pinouts, uh, and it's incredible to think, you know, just from the Type A connector moving into the Type uh, C connector, uh, that it's just how much different those two connector types are. So um, very much worth uh, going and checking that out. After this show, of course, you stay where you are for now, of course, that's uh, important. But yeah, it's a great course, and Tavis uh, is a good presenter, right? I'm starting to get worried. <laughs> I think so, um, but but I, I think your position is safe. Tavis only likes to talk about USB, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> so as long as you stay wide-ranging, everything will be fine. Do you think so? Okay. Well, in that case, if there's uh, no further ado, let's go straight into the news. First up, um, you gave me some reading to do here. This was very interesting. Um, the, the North American USB device market forecast. I always think forecasts are quite tricky, but um, anyway, what was your takeaway on this? Uh, the, the, the key takeaway for me, the thing that I thought was, two things I thought were interesting. One is how much the automotive industry has impact on, uh, on USB devices, right? They're predicting 10% mm. uh, annual growth rate for the next six or seven years for USB mm. devices. Mm. Uh, much of that driven by the automotive market. And if you think about it, yes, uh, people do like plugging USB things into their cars these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but more relevant to Pro-AV was the effect, uh, the effect the pandemic had had on USB devices. And it was twofold. It was on the supply side, they mentioned, you know, as in, as in many electronic industries, mm. sort of a crunch on factories being able to, to produce devices and this having a, a negative impact uh, on sales, of course. Mm. But on the other hand, as people are staying home more, working from home more, they want to upgrade their home office mm. setups. Uh, a lot of this is those streaming cameras, those, those USB attached microphones, maybe right. more mass storage devices for transferring all the work data that they're doing. Sure. Uh, that's driving an increased demand uh, mm. for USB devices. That's driving that overall growth. And that growth is massive, right? I mean, it was going from, it's going to double from 2019 through 2024, four or seven. But in a short space of time, it was going, the marketplace was going to double, uh, which was pretty impressive. Um, I mean, it's, I always find it interesting that how they, how they managed to get those forecasts down to almost the, 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 the cent. Um, but yeah, it's, it's clear that there's going to be a, a huge growth. And that kind of leads us to the second piece of news, because um, this was... As I've been working with Tavis over the last um, week or so with uh, building out the courseware, uh, this was a real eye-opener for me, the whole USB-C, USB-3 piece. Um, and, you know, it, I, I suspect a lot of you out there are saying, no, Matt, don't say that. But it's, a lot of people can mis mistake the fact that, oh, well, USB-C connectors must be USB-3. But they're really not. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of difference between them. And I don't want to give too much away from, you know, today's interview. Um, but this piece was was a real, you know, uh, reinforcement for everything that I've learned over the last, over the last um, week working with Tavis. Uh, and, you know, the whole forecast thing from before in the previous news section, 
Um, I'm thinking, well, they've, they've got quite a long way to go, really, to, 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 to not standardise, but to, to make it really clear. You know, USB 3 doesn't need USB-C. Different USB-C type of connectors and cables and the drawer and the power drawer and the, the bandwidth. There's a, it's a minefield, really, isn't it? There's, yeah, there is. There's a real challenge for, I think, for the, for the USB people, right? The USB IF, I think that is. Hmm. Um, you know, and, and it, hmm. we, we touched on it just the tiniest bit in the, in the video clip that you showed before, right? Where Tavis says, oh, here's, here's full speed, and here's high speed, and here's super speed, and then we got super speed plus, and super speed plus plus. <laughs> plus plus. Um, <laughs> it, it makes sense, but, but that's only worrying about the different, the different data speeds, right? What we touch hmm. on here, it, and first of all, we should we should clarify the first thing the article says is that the difference is USB-C is a type of connector. USB-3 is a protocol that defines how fast and, and how the things operate, right? So as you said, USB-C might carry a USB-2 signal or it might carry a USB-4 signal or one of the USB-3 signals, of course. But mm. connector types versus protocol standards are, are, are different elements. And that's and that's the difference between these two. But But then the article gets into all of the extra features that a USB-C cable can bring, which is mm. not only carrying USB signals, but carrying native video signals. It has extra mm. pins set aside so that you could move DisplayPort or HDMI over this cable, not mm. as a USB signal, but as a, as a DisplayPort, as an HDMI yeah. signal. Uh, you can carry a lot of power over these cables, you know, the 100 watts to charge your laptop. Um, and yet different devices have different capabilities, different cables support different mm. versions of those features. Uh, it becomes a real challenge uh, for the mm. for the folks in charge of communicating that to the broader audience. And mm. remember, this is not just a pro AV audience, right? Here in pro AV, we're all relatively uh, sophisticated when it comes to technology and understanding these things. But but USB is after a mass market uh, of a lot of folks that don't live their lives inside the technology bubble. Uh, and being able to communicate all these things is a is a challenge that I'm glad isn't on my plate, frankly. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and it's worth mentioning as well that there's a piece about Thunderbolt in there. Um, you know, just the, the type of USB-C cable. Uh, you don't just assume that one cable is going to serve all purposes because it doesn't. In fact, towards the end of the article, <clears throat> uh, it really makes your eyes open when you think in the earlier stages of USB-C, a cable was able to draw, you know, potentially too much from a, from a machine it was connected to and fry it. Uh, that's not the case now. You know, it's very quickly being uh, resolved as, as the, ge the, the Gen 1 and Gen 2 have, have increased. But, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a case. I, I had a similar issue when I was getting some USB connectivity from my, uh, I've got a MacBook and I'm plugging it into a 4K monitor. And you can't just go out and get a USB. There's a USB-C cable that comes with the device. You know, a lot of devices now come with USB-C for charging, etc. That'll work for that device but it just isn't universal. You can't just plug it into any USB-C and it will serve all purposes. So, you know, lots to think about there. Um, and, and thankfully, Justin, we've got the right guy to help us think it through, haven't we? I think so. Yes, yes. I, think, I think if anyone can clear this up for us, uh, Tavis will be the guy to help. Okay, well, let's bring him on. In that case, Tavis, are you there, sir? Here he is. Hello, hey, guys. Tavis. How are you? Welcome. Great. Thank you for the invite. You're, you're welcome, of course. We, uh, this, is a, this is a hot topic these days, uh, and we're very happy to have someone who, who lives and breathes it every day uh, to tell us about it. So first, tell us a, a little bit about yourself, Tavis. I mean, I told them you're a technical business manager, but what do you do day to day besides just plugging and unplugging USB devices? Sure, sure. So my responsibilities at Icron are, 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 are multifaceted as most of us have more many hats. Uh, in North America, I'm responsible for uh, our OEM uh, partners, our OEM customers. So I deal a lot in embedded applications. Um, but I also have a field applications engineering responsibility as well here in North America, uh, as well as in Europe. So I spend a lot of time talking to engineers, system designers, specifiers, installers, if you will, on the front side of things to, to, to help them navigate their, their plans and their course of action and then um, they, they get eventually handed off to our internal tech support team for the, for the deep stuff when they start getting on the front lines with them. Sure, sure is, is and I guess give us a little intro to Icron for anybody who doesn't know. Yeah, so Icron Technologies has, has been around for almost as long as USB has been around. So our founders um, immediately recognized that uh, back in those days, being limited to five meters of cable length, 
may be an issue for some. Um, and, uh, and that was well ahead of the curve of where we are right now with the, uh, the consumption of high speed video, uh, in these, in these, uh, conference, uh, venues. And so we'd like to think of ourselves, um, uh, not only as a product company, um, but as a technology supplier as well, especially to our embedded customers. Um, and what we do every day and the only thing we do is USB extension. Um, it's such a simple statement to make, um, but the devil's in the details and, uh, and it's hard to do. Can you give us a little a little flavor of that? I mean, it, it, twenty years ago when we needed to extend our VGA signal, you know, you buy a longer cable. Maybe the picture gets a little fuzzy, but it but it works, right? Well, how is how is there a whole company built around the idea of extending USB? What what's the challenge? So USB fundamentally, if you had to distill it all down, is extremely sensitive to its timing constraints. So. Um, basically, when you send information from one side of the USB network to the other, there's a small window of time that something has to be communicated back. Think of it as in terms of an ACK packet or something like that. Very, very small windows of time. Uh, and the standard, even till today, um, has, has never been um, designed to embrace long transmission lines of the concept of extension. Um, you recall that USB was basically to connect um, your computer of what a laptop or PC to something that was probably going to be, you know, an arm's length away, you know, a keyboard, a mouse and a printer. And so that high speed information didn't have to travel very far, far down a wire. So timing maybe wasn't so hard to, to, to achieve. But now when you want to take that, you know, six foot distance of your arm, arm's length away and turn that into 330 feet, well, we've got some physics in the way. And that's that's the challenge on the extender companies is how do you how do you accommodate added latency and delay in the communication path without having USB fall over? Because again, USB is not designed for it. Wow. Okay. How much of the of the of your extension marketplace is is focused in Pro AV then? Well, however, you want to quantify that that you're that you're comfortable with is fine. But I. I I'm wondering, I'm, I'm thinking that Pro-AV must be a lot of the, the places where people want to do extension. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if, if you were to, uh, our, our customer engagement uh, in the field is, it's, is going to be dominated by people doing things with cameras and, and audio devices. Um, that, that is definitely the lion's share of it. Um, but the, the comfortable legacy stuff is always going to be there as well, too. I mean, even though we're, we're focusing on USB 3 and, and, and beyond today, um, USB 1.1 even is, is still important for our, our people doing KVM applications where you're extending um, mice and, and, and keyboards and things like that to multiple consoles. But yeah, definitely it's, it's, it's high quality video is, is what we're getting involved with most of the time. Well, it sounds like you're, you're already touching on the answer to my next question, but what's, what's, what's hot around USB and, and Pro-AV? What's the interesting new or just the dominant uh, application that's, that's challenging and, and taking up your time? Yeah, so it, it's, it's kind of the, the, you know, how far behind the leading edge of technology does, uh, does it take industry to catch up to what's available? And um, a couple of years ago, we released our, our flagship USB 3.2.1 extension technology, um, and it's and it's growing, still growing very very well. Um, and back then, it was a it was a it was a fancy uh, device to extend USB 3 Gen 1 signals up to 330 feet, point to point. Um, it was impressive, uh, but it seemed to be more of a of a of a Cadillac solution in a in a luxurious uh, application. But um, as time has moved on. Um, people's expectations or outcomes through this collaboration systems is that uh, they have a USB 3 camera that's delivering all this data um, into these fancy algorithms that our UCC clients can provide like for our, our digital backgrounds or uh, automatic framing, all these other things that really, really benefit or work better with USB 3 resolution and frame rate. And so those, those optional luxurious, you know, be nice to have, so become, in, become into a, a state of, we have to have USB 3.0 extension. Um, and so now we've got this, this, this critical mass where the industry has, has accepted our USB 3.0 extender as, as something that is viable um, and something to strongly consider on these new, new con, uh, contracts. Uh, and now we're getting asked for what's next, uh, meaning how do I get this USB 3.0 extension 
over a LAN now. So getting away from point to point and putting this onto a network, um, that's the next big push that, that we're working on. That will be uh, that will be an interesting challenge, right? We're talking about some some very high bandwidths um, to to push over a network. Yeah, what kinds and, of applications? And, and it's always uh, important. Go ahead. So sorry, yeah, it's, it's a very important thing, and, and, and worth mentioning right now too, is that as we learn more and more about these evolving technologies, it's it's this to have that stuff filed away in the back of your mind. Uh, oh, this USB three can do, deliver this payload, this bandwidth, for instance. But if I intend to integrate that with other other uh, data sources, video, audio, or otherwise, and push that through a, a common LAN, <laughs> you start running out of pipe pretty quick. Things things add up. What are the applications for? I can understand applications for extending uh, high bandwidth USB, right? You know, simple stuff, right? I've got a I've got a Zoom room, I've got a camera on one end, and I've got a PC on the other end of the room. I need to extend it. What kind of applications are people looking into where they want to switch? USB. They want to move it over the network uh, in those high bandwidth ways. Yeah, it, it's um, some of the larger venues will will like to use a, uh, some sort of a matrix switch, either something that's um, you know a, a conventional matrix switch, or maybe using something that's um, using the LAN as your switch, um, or some are using AV bridges to to be the switching locations, and it's usually serving multiple camera angles um, in 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 larger venues in academia, for instance, where you might have to move okay. th across four or five different cameras throughout a given session. And there is, you know, obviously professional producers on, on hand to do all that. Um, so there's, there's a real demand to, to switch cameras that way. An another, uh, there's many applications, I guess another popular one too, is if you're in a multifunction space, um, say at a conference center or a hotel ballroom, and you're dealing with, um, one large shared space that can be repartitioned or reconfigured on the fly. And there's a variety of AV drops, you know, scattered throughout the venue. And the idea is you use, use the LAN um, as your switch to, to set up shop where these nodes need to come out of the floor and, and, and be in the specific location. Yeah. Switching is very important there as well too. Okay. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, in that large venue case you mentioned, it almost, it almost feels like that's a place where, where broadcast cameras and SDI cameras, you know, used to be the thing. Do you see, do you see USB cameras encroaching on other more traditional cameras as we move ahead? Um, I, I think it's it's possible. I guess the the in our in our world when we're dealing with our Pro AV customers as one entity and our broadcast customers as a different entity. Um, I, I think one common thing in the video domain and audio domain is this is the concept of uh, time sync. Um, in, in USB, uh, there is no timing management system built into the, into the protocol. Um, so there, in order to get accurate time syncing, you have to do more things. Whereas in the broadcast world, through SEMTI standards, it's, it's baked into everything. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, the, there's, there's, there's a cost benefit to USB 3 based devices, you know, compared to, to broadcast equivalents or similar broadcast type equipment. Mm -hmm. and, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with USB 4, I think. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm not part of any of these groups to help define this stuff, but the thing that I picked up on in USB 4 is, is we now have uh, a timing management system in the USB 4 standard. So there is, it is conceivable that we can exploit that um, for accurate time sync now in a, in a USB domain that we never had before. That's, so I think that's it, interesting. Give Let some me more pause you there, because let me pause you because I wanted to talk a little bit about USB 2, 3, and 4, uh, but right now I need to go check with Matt, so let's save it for the after show, and we'll see you there, Tavis. Gotcha. Great interview, great interview.
uh, lots of uh, I told lots you of he stuff. Knew a lot of stuff. Oh, doesn't he? Just yeah. Um, and and yeah, you really must go check out the course um, once we finished here. I think there's a link to it just down here as well, and the resources section. Um, but it's it's a great course. Um, it goes into a lot more detail than you saw in that snippet. So uh, yeah, fantastic course. Um, just lots of uh, lots of uh, feedback coming in from the, from the from the uh, from our guests, which is which is great news. Uh, Matthias, love that. How about SDVOU? <laughs> uh, I think it's a great idea. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up with Tavis, maybe, maybe off the live show. We'll have a couple of private meetings and we'll see what we can do. Uh, just to let you know as well, uh, to say thank you more than to Pierre, Pierre Sicard. Pierre is, uh, is on behalf of SDVOE. He's, he's in the chat and he's, uh, he's fielding your questions very nicely. Thank you. So thank you, Pierre. Uh, merci, Pierre. Um, uh, Justin, do you want to give us a bit of, uh, bit of housekeeping, if you wouldn't mind? That would be great. I uh, just wanted to remind everyone about the after show. If you're watching us on demand, uh, the after show is available exclusively inside the SDVOE Academy. Uh, so if you're watching it on demand in the Academy, click the link at the end and you'll jump right to the after show. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel uh, or on Twitter, uh, again, find a link in the show description. Uh, get over to the SDVOE Academy where you'll sign up for a free account uh, and you'll be able to see the questions from this live audience. Uh, come to Tavis. Uh, and we're going to have a little more in-depth discussion on USB 2 versus 3 versus 4. Uh, what are those real and, and relevant differences? Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, yeah, just to remind you, the hashtag again, SDVOE Live. We've got a lot of uh, take up now on Twitter. You'll be pleased to hear, Justin. So thank you to everybody out there in the Twitter audience who's joining us. Uh, but do click the live chat link there and, uh, and get yourself into the after show because that's where you can absolutely interact with Tavis and us directly get your questions through lots and lots of questions they're piling in now uh, Justin but before we go into the after show uh, let's just uh, let's just get from you a little bit out what to expect next time in in the lucky for some episode 13 <laughs> lucky episode 13 uh, our friend Gary K is going to join us uh, Gary has been been talking for a long time about the concept of a, a digital canvas uh, the idea that that the content should be thought of as as content that can be sort of laid out somewhere in this vast array of pixels rather than displayed on this one screen right but imagine if, if everything behind me were a whole world of pixels and I could put some content here some content there a little list down here um, I'll let him explain it better than I do uh, but it's a really interesting topic for us because SDVOE uh, offers a really flexible way to implement this concept uh, in fact you'll see in a recent article published by Gary uh, one of our founding members, ZV, has actually put together uh, a, a, a function of their software controller for SDVOE that enables this digital canvas concept. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's something really important for the industry going forward, totally setting aside uh, SDVOE. Uh, just the idea of displays being defined by a number of pixels on a wall rather than by you know, the size and shape of this particular piece of glass. I think cool. that's really where we're headed. Uh, in terms of big trends. And this is going to be our first chance to dive in uh, with Gary and talk about that. So it should be exciting. Fantastic. And uh, he'd probably, could, probably have to give us some tips on what we can do here at SDVOE House as well. Maybe, maybe now that we're, we're getting lots of people out there viewing us, maybe it's time for some upgrades. If you can pop your hand in your pocket and pull out some, some shekels, we can maybe afford some upgrades. What do you think to that? Well, yeah. I think as long as SDVOE can do it, we can get all our gear for free, right? Exactly, that's the idea. Stick around, people. After show next, thank you for joining us here. We'll see you in a second. Let's go get ready, Justin. Bye-bye.